much enjoyed that. I got to be down at Bakey Road Baptist Church in 1994, and so you can imagine I'm quite a legend down there. And uh, I got to be there first year we traveled for the college, and uh, remember Brother Pastor Gail Russ and Brother Russ, and of course Brother Tim, pastors in Evansville, Indiana. And what a great family, what a great ministry, and uh, how we've been blessed by it over the years for sure. And so James chapter 1, if you could turn back there, please, I appreciate it. You will not miss the kickoff of the ball game tonight if you have a DVR. Uh, DVR has improved my church attendance by 37%, so I'm up over 40% now. <laughs> It doesn't matter what the situation, I have an airtight alibi prepared. And uh, no, I, my team won, so I could be spiritual. Who cares about a dead pig being kicked across the pasture through some plumbing? That's what the Hiles used to say so often. People die and go into hell, and you guys care about a football game. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not buying it. James chapter 1, James, a servant of God. And by the way, most all would agree that this is the half-brother of Christ who did not believe that his older half-brother was the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, until after the resurrection of Christ. And the appearance, and pretty amazing, of course, Jude, a similar story. And, uh, but he's writing here, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he's writing to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. And they were scattered. They were, the biblical event is oftentimes called the dispersion. They were dispersed because of the persecution. And uh, why would a God who is good all the time allow this to happen to me? And I'm running for my life. And uh, the perspective, of course, we have with looking back through antiquity and history and hindsight. And, but my brethren, verse 2, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Notice he said when, not if. And uh, certainly preaching on the subject of suffering, I'm, you know, and this is not just something you say, and I don't gloss over this, but there are, at a, at a church this size, scores of people uh, eminently more qualified than I to preach on this subject, and I certainly don't claim to have the ministry of suffering. Uh, I was looking at Brother Randy Rogers and thinking of Brother Bill Boyd where he usually has his chair and of course Josh Greeno and, and I shouldn't say Will Henson and uh, Nicholas Comstock and of course we think of the Briner family, unimaginable, uncomprehendable to most of us, although some of you can. As I consoled my daughter yesterday when she gave me the news of Philip's home going and uh, of course I thought of the morning I consoled her with Amanda and when she was 16 years old and just uh, two young people, choice young people out of that class. And, and, and I don't think any explanation suffices. And I can only, you know, you hear testify to the grace that's given to families like that. And I can't imagine the, the shocking, numbing phone call, nor do I want to. Uh, but suffering, you know, empathy is a powerful thing. You know, Christ was tempted in all points like we, yet without sin. We have a Savior that was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He was acquainted with our grief. Uh, there's nothing that you can go through that Christ hasn't gone through. And uh, he is the victim. He is the violator. He who knew no sin would become sin on the cross. And so he empathizes. Empathy means you, you know, sympathy is when you feel bad for someone. Empathy is when you feel bad with someone. That's a powerful statement when you can say, I know how you feel. It's abused all too often, you know, when, oh, my mom and dad are breaking up, they're getting a divorce, and, and the anger and the, the heartbreak and the remorse and the bitterness, and the people respond differently, but uh, to say, well, I know how you feel. Oh, your mom and dad divorce? I uh, know. Well, you don't know how I feel then. And it's a powerful thing. Some of you have gone through some deplorable circumstances in your life, and nothing will help you more than to help somebody else go through something similar the powerful tool of empathy. You know, politicians, they, they feign it, and uh, I feel your pain. You know, we think of the Clinton administration, and he ought to, he caused it. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm not endorsing a candidate because he's many, many years ago, and, but I'm still hoping Ronald Reagan gets reincarnated sometime soon. Uh, by the way, 
I just felt like the, the, the applause this morning was a little bit inadequate because it was Ronald Reagan and I who single-handedly, or, or as a dynamic duo, ended the Cold War. But don't worry about it. And I appreciate the clap offering, and, but I could use a gift card. And, but empathy. And I say that tongue-in-cheek, of course. Uh, but count it all joy when suffering is certain, so consequently we need to prepare ourselves. Well, I don't, I, I don't want to think about it, but you need to think about it. And it's coming. The phone call is coming. Time and chance happeneth to us all. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 15, as it happeneth to the fool, it happeneth even to me. And that's why we're shocked, and there's nothing to totally prepare you for it. Uh, but however, we ought to take every step necessary, because count it all joy when, not if, you fall into divers' temptation. By the way, God does not, and it says it in this chapter, God does not tempt people in the form of enticing. God tempted Abraham, Genesis 22, but he didn't, he didn't entice him. How can you tell if you're being tempted or tested? It's a really uh, quick test. You know, if you're being enticed, uh, it's, it's too good to be true. It offers immediate pleasure and gain. It's too good to be true. I was driving down Holman Avenue on a, on a Sunday afternoon many, many years ago. I uh, just graduated. I was teaching the B Young Adult class. And the, uh, Brother Eddie, we shared the same Sunday school class for many years in the Walker Building, second floor. And I, bought a, I had a Cadillac. Here I am, a recent graduate, and now I'm a Christian educator, uh, Hammond Baptist Junior High, Bible teacher. And the reason I got into Christian education and specifically fundamentalism, because it's, that's, it's very lucrative. That's where the money is. And, uh, and, so, and I had a Cadillac. It was a used Cadillac that I had bought off my father-in-law, and my father-in-law says he gives the Ark, he's from, he's from Kingsport, Tennessee, but he gives the Arkansas guarantee, which means 30 minutes or 30 miles, whichever comes first. And so, but my father-in-law would never rip me off, and he didn't, he did it, he did rip me off, but it was inadvertent, and at least that's what he said. But I'm diving out home in Avenue, it was January, and I think Brother Marco LaRiviere was with me, and, and we went to the mobile station and, and uh, get a couple, uh, uh, just get a uh, sugar high so I could get through teaching the Word of God to some busted young adults. And, but anyway, I said, man, this car, this car is too good to be true, being the prophet that I am. I no sooner uttered those words when cold air started coming out of the heat vents. And, you know, so you, 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 crank, you start squeezing the knob to the right like it's going to make a difference. And, and I ultimately would check the dipstick, and it looked like milk. And it was uh, kind, of, uh, kind of a caramel milk and a coffee or chocolate milk, but the block was warped, and the car was too good to be true. Immediate, it's a baited trap. This, man, this is too good to be true. Scratch off that lottery. This is too good to be true. It is. It's a baited trap. It's too good to be true. It's, it, you're being enticed. Temptation offers immediate loss and pain. You know, the military men and ladies that stood this morning, you know, it's uh, and especially, I think, um, admirable, and, and uh, it's just, uh, it speaks volumes, a great commentary on our military. Today, they're volunteer. None of them were drafted. And there's really not a whole lot of misconceptions what's going to happen when you join the military. I joined the military, and I actually went in in November of 1984, and uh, that's how I feel. And uh, Jeremy, how old are you? 29. When I was your age, I was 29. And hey, write that down. Uh, <laughs> but John and Jay Allen, where are you Friday night visiting as visitors? And uh, John and Jay, are they here? Going to another church in the area? There they are. How old are you guys? 32, okay, making sure your story's straight, consistent with Friday. 32 years old, how did that happen? And I thought, man, I talked to them in junior high yesterday, it seems, and just, uh, and junior hires, they, they grow up, and it's a scary thing. And it, all the cliches that you heard, uh, you echo. But uh, the point being, I forget what I was saying now, Jeremy, you messed me up. Uh, you know, this, this uh, back to, back to the, the train of thought, the military, 1984, Thanksgiving Day, 1984, was my first day in the Army, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, the novelty of Fort Sill was pretty awesome for a boy coming from Rhode Island because I'm in the West for the first time in my life. Flown on an airplane out of Boston to uh, Oklahoma City for the first time in my life. And, and uh, Fort Sill is where Geronimo jumped off Medicine's Bluff and yelled his own name, Geronimo, and lived. He's actually died many, many years later and is buried on that post. And I thought, man, cowboys and Indians, this is, this is where it all happened. It's awesome. And that lasted for about 30 minutes, and the novelty quickly wore off. And, uh, but everything that identified me 
and my attempt to identify myself, my perfectly faded blue jeans. I remember my hoodie sweatshirt. I had a uh, New England Patriots hat. I had a uh, I had an OP T-shirt back then. Ocean Pacific was was it. Now it's like starter. They sold out, and now you get it at Walmart. I hate to burst your bubble. And uh, but I, it was awesome. And you had to every everything that was us. They took away from us our hair and our clothes. Every article of clothing they took every everything. They deprived us deprivation. They deprived us of everything. So we all that to become a private and e nothing. No rank on my collar, no hair on my head. Everything was battle dress, uniform, and camouflage, or OG, olive green. And, uh, and so the military folks that stood today, everything, everything taken away. They ran out of things to take away. They put a vending machine in our basic training courtyard there just because they ran out of things to take away. They had to give us something so you can't have any candy. And uh, the, oh, the military range, the, the M16, well, I know how to shoot. I'm a hunter, 410 shotgun. Well, you're not shooting a 410. You're shooting an M16. Forget everything you know. Now they take away our mind. And my drill instructor said, I'm going to be your mom for the next nine weeks. And I said, I sure could use a hug, mom. And <laughs> actually, I said, I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. Don't try that with drill instructors. They don't care. And some have compassion making a difference. Some don't. Uh, but what a difference they made. They took everything away long before you can become a, long before I became Sergeant Taft. And I was a private and private theft, debt privation and privation. So suffering is necessary. And if you're going to be tested by God and tempted in that form of the word, and it offers immediate loss and pain, the ultimate result is you are a soldier, a sailor, an airman, a marine, a paratrooper, a U.S. Army Ranger, a Navy SEAL. In fact, the more elite you're going to be for our nation, the more you're going to be asked to give and give up. And so the fellowship of his sufferings. It's important that we have a mindset uh, that we understand this concept of suffering. Suffering is certain. Suffering is certified. Of course, in verse 14 of James chapter 1, verse 12, I should say, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. Not only does it give that resiliency on earth, but it gives rewards in heaven. And it's important that we go through it. It's important that we can take it and we decide, oh, I can't take it anymore. Really, what you're saying is I, I won't take it anymore. You know, thinking of Brother Randy Namoville here and all our missionaries, and he kind of em amplifies and, you know, and, and symbolizes them tonight. And, uh, you know, the, 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 what they give up, they give up America so they can be elite for the cause of Christ and to impact eternity. Boy, your heart ought to go out to them. If there's a way you can contribute and uh, with the music missions program, that's, that's, that's a great way to contribute to the cause of Christ. And so the suffering and the people that gave up America and ridiculous, unprecedented prosperity. And so shame on us for not only not praising God or thanking God, as Brother Eddie said uh, this morning, and, uh, but we go beyond that and bellyache and gripe and murmur. And so we need, we need a good old-fashioned dose of, uh, of suffering, and I can take it, and I can be hardcore for the Lord. I can get up early. I can stay up late. You know, the devil, knowing his time is short, works overtime, and he's got seven more years than we have. If the Lord does not tarry and we're raptured, we're out of here, but he'll continue and uh, little or no resistance initially during the tribulation, and he's working overtime. Our time is shorter than his, and we're working part-time or no time. We ought to have the mentality, and uh, listen, I, I, I'm in. I'm in all the way, and I'm in it to stay. There is no discharge from this war. I'm going to be part-time, sure, but full-time, overtime, anytime, every time. I'm going to be, I'm going I'm to take it. And, uh, and I'm going to make it. And by the grace of God and for the cause of Christ, I will give almost a supernatural effort and to that cause and of the cross. And so suffering is certain and suffering is certified. God knows what is happening. He's not surprised. And we've heard similar statements made time and time again. But just a little perspective tonight, and I will not be long. And, um, but the, the sorts of sufferings, and we could be categorical, you know, and again, emotionally, the people I mentioned, the Crutchfield family, a celebration and graduation of Brother Crutchfield yesterday and, and, uh, and, and different points in different people's lives and all of us will go through the loss of a loved one and then we define premature death as especially shocking for sure. But, but you know, the, 
the, the, the physical suffering of a loved one and then the emotional suffering is vicariously. You suffer with them, you're burdened for them, the diagnosis, and then the finality. Praise the Lord, the finality of death for a child of God is pretty temporal. But the Crutchfield died, comma, and will live happily ever after. Philip Reiner passed away the other night, early Saturday morning, I think it was, and uh, long before the coroner arrived on that scene, he was present with the Lord. And I, you know, folks, we, we say those things, but we believe them, do we not? And so there's grace, but the emotional suffering, physically suffering, and I mentioned, you know, Brother Boyd, 11 years plus since he fell as a young pastor trying to supplement his income when he fell, and Brother Randy, and uh, the 90s, I think, when you fell, no doubt, and how many years, and of course, it's, they, it's not by themselves, it's the spouse and the family that suffers along, and I can't imagine, nor do I want to, what they've gone through, but physically and financially and, and socially, you know, how many college students will quit because somebody breaks up with them, or you don't even get that far? You know, they, they, they don't even, they don't even, you know, if you're still, by the way, college students, do you like me? Yes or no? And that's, that's kind of grade school and pre-adolescent, and uh, you're a college student. Be a little more savvy. Do you like me? Yes or yes? And, uh, of course, we, we take restraining orders against you, and you cannot be within five pews. Uh, you know, but that hurts. Rejection hurts. And uh, nobody likes that. It happens soul winning. Law of averages. More often than not, people are going to say no. So socially, we suffer. And again, all the sorts of sufferings and, and on and on. We could go and, and uh, so it's, it's happening. It's going to happen. It's going to happen time and time again. A perennial process. And we need to increase our emotional, physical, financial. But listen, America does not want to tighten her belt. At First Baptist Church, we've had to tighten our belt. And uh, consequently, people will suffer, and that's unfortunate and not ideal, and idealism takes a hit, no doubt about it. However, ultimately, it's good. It's good for America if we can go without and be wise stewards of our money. And uh, so, the sorts of sufferings, the source of sufferings, let, let, let me give you three sources of sufferings, and I'll be done. Number one, Savior-induced suffering. Savior-induced God tempted Abraham, for the alliteration's sake, I'll, I'll use the, the letter S and Savior. But, you know, there's consolation when God puts you through the fire. You know, the, the, the steel mills around here, and they, the metal is molten at one point, and they pour it into a, a humongous hollow bowl. By the way, it's called a crucible. The military academies uh, have what they call the crucible, and the word crew, and the form of the word, the prefix, oftentimes, C-R-U, uh, crucify, crucifixion, excruciating pain, and the crucible. And when God puts you through the fire, I thought of Ron Hamilton tonight as the Russes and Brother Chamberlain were singing, and, uh, and of course the cancer. And without the cancer and the loss of eye, the, the eye, there would be no recognizable name as Patch the Pirate. We may or may not hypothetically recognize the name Ron Hamilton, but what a great ministry. Because of the suffering and the loss of an eye, and the gaining of a great opportunity to influence many, many people with a powerful tool of music. But Savior induced, that I may come forth as gold. Faith is giving God the benefit of the doubt. God, I don't understand it. My counselors, again, their, their, their attempts to give an explanation, even by their own admission, is insufficient. It's, it's weak. It's, it's inadequate. But I don't have to have a sufficient explanation. You are not on trial. You're not on probation. You are good all the time. And even if you're not feeling it, faith has nothing to do with the feeling. And you ought to say it, even if it rings a little hollow, even in your own ears. And But Savior induced suffering. It may be on the other side of glory. It may be at the judgment seat of Christ. When, boy, now, I, you know, Paul said, I, 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 three times I asked the Lord in a season of prayer, God, please, it made perfect sense to me, please remove that thorn. Uh, a messenger of Satan came to buffet me, and uh, that thorn of my flesh, I could be so much more effective and efficient as I effort thy cause if you'd remove that thorn from my flesh. In retrospect, Paul said, boy, when I look back, I was it was oblivious to me then, now it's obvious. Boy, I praise God, I glory in my infirmities and my distresses and my persecutions for Christ's sake. This is ironic and paradoxical, but when I was weak, that's ironically when I was strong. 
And if God hadn't given me that or allowed that thorn to be given me, I, I would have turned a continent upside down for the cause of Christ. The Holy Spirit wouldn't have inspired me to read over half the New Testament if you count up the verses. And he says, I, my strength is found and uh, perfection and uh, God's strength is found, made perfect in my weakness. And so I glory in my suffering. And so you don't have to understand it. And uh, we all see Dr. Colston labor to get up and walk to the, walk to the pulpit to read the verses. And, and, uh, and so praise the Lord for a coherent mind. And how many people physically have everything going for them, but they lose the faculties. And, and how, how reassuring it is time and time again when he reads uh, the, the Bible and the scripture to preface a message. And, and, uh, but the suffering there with the stroke and the pain and the chronic pain that some of you live with. Again, I, I don't want to empathize. I don't empathize. And, uh, but that's, that's a whole other level that God brings you to and uh, powerful and effective. Again, as you have for the cause of Christ, Savior and do suffering. The children of Israel, the 12 tribes were scattered abroad. God lit a fire under them so they could get the gospel out. We get too comfortable. We get too complacent. And uh, I find it very difficult myself to tell if I can't tell if I'm content or complacent. And sometimes settling in this side of Jordan like the two and a half tribes seems to be okay. And uh, this is good enough. And so we got to be careful about that. And uh, God wants us to go on. Now, Savior induced suffering. Next, Satan induced suffering. Savior induced suffering designed to bring out the best in you, designed to purify you. Satan induced suffering designed to bring out the worst in you. It's a baited trap designed to pervert or pollute you. And uh, we, we know all this. This is not a revelation. could be a revolutionary reminder. And, uh, you know, we just sometimes, I know, I know, that's the, that's the alibi to the adolescent. They know, they know, they know. And I thought of Romans chapter 1 as Dr. Lapina was preaching this morning. And when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. But they knew God. And uh, the first thing that went was that gratitude and that thankfulness. And it's one of the symptoms of the last days when perilous times shall come. A commentary on the 21st century. But... Satan induced suffering. This consolation, if God puts you through the fire, you're going to go to another level. You're going to be more elite. More things are being taken away. God's going to do more with me. And he gives the grace, and I'll give him the glory. Satan induced suffering. Well, there's consolation there because if, if Satan, uh, Jesus I know, Paul I knew, know, a high-ranking demon said, who are you? If Satan comes after you, he's not omniscient. He doesn't know everybody. It's hypothetical. Who does he know? Who does he not know? And, uh, but if you become a priority target, that trophy buck, you know, then you must be doing something right. Satanic oppression, that's, that's not an acceptable excuse or alibi or explanation. But the Bible does say David, Satan provoked David to number the people. And 70,000 people died. And uh, Brother Wilson preached on that, that text. And, and uh, when the 70,000 people died, and get thee behind me. Hey, Peter, get thee behind me. And Satan, by the way, Peter, Satan wants you. Specifically, he singled you out. You're impetuous, you're impulsive, and, but he realizes potential. He's got, at that point, 4,000 years of human history to tap. He knows the patterns. And boy, if you get right and this whole thing clicks in and you reconcile what is happening now and when I ascend to heaven 40 days after being resurrected from the Mount of Olives and resurrected from the tomb, but I ascend from the Mount of Olives and it kicks in and Pentecost and the Holy Ghost gives you that omnipotent aid, boy, what you can do. And for the cause of Christ, so consequently, Satan wants you and he wants to sift you as wheat. And uh, Satan wants you. I mentioned it, Solomon as it happened to the fool, that happened even to me. Proverbs 7, many strong men have been slain by her. And so we got to be careful. we got to be vigilant. we got to be on guard. We can't give place to the devil. We know all these things, but yet how many of us will end up on the wrong end of the statistical chart? I know, I know, I know. And watching the clock. Bears kick off. My team won. Uh, let's be more spiritual than that. And I shouldn't have reminded you. Savior induced suffering, Satan induced suffering. Lastly, but I divide this last category into 27 groups. By the way, I haven't even started yet. Just kidding. Don't you hate that? Don't you hate what I preach? Yeah, you did start and you're done. And by the way, you're going to have to listen on purpose from this point on because yeah, we're going to use the Bibles a lot. I want this to become adversarial. Just kidding. 
please don't. Can't you just quote it? No. <laughs> self-induced suffering. And uh, self and I think of Plaxico Burris after uh, he became a Super Bowl champion as a wide receiver scored the winning touchdown and escapes me what team they beat. It was my team. And, uh, but they, he, he went to a nightclub. And as he's walking up to another level, literally a higher, another floor in the nightclub, he had a handgun and the handgun went off and he shot himself and, uh, and they, of course, prosecuted him. He went to jail. Plaxico Burroughs, an all-pro receiver, Super Bowl champion receiver, went to jail and uh, what are you in for? I shot somebody. Who'd you shoot? Me. And so the moral of the story, if this is the only thing you get out of this message tonight, register your handgun before you shoot yourself. He didn't shoot himself on the foot, he shot himself on the thigh, the hamstring. That is, that is self-induced suffering. It is cliche, shooting yourself in the foot. Some of you, bam, you reload. Bam, 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 bam. You know, you ought to be, hello. And you know, self-induced suffering. Why are you in jail? Because I'm an idiot. <laughs> Let's just cut to the chase. And so, self-induced, self-inflicted, self-sabotaging behavior. You, you, are, you are your own worst enemy. I know. You know, some of you, we see you on Friday nights and restoration always results in rejoicing and we're glad you're there. And I am. You come full circle. That's awesome. And then full circle becomes vicious circle. And I'm back. All right. You're going to be gone again. And uh, we'll be clinical. We'll be excited. It's hard to get excited the 22nd time as it was the first time. And so, uh, but the fact of the matter is, some of you, it's not the devil. It's not, it's not, it's not this God. It's you. And by the way, sometimes, again, talking about giving God the benefit of the doubt, imagine Job. Job went to God and said, God, you have any idea what I'm going through? I lost my children. They're gone. They're all gone. My livestock is gone. My wealth is gone. My health is gone. I'm in an ash heap, scraping away the flesh. My wife, perhaps as an act of compassion, said, why don't you just get it over with? Curse God and die. And she wasn't a foolish woman, and, but she spoke as a foolish woman for that little parenthesis. And, and uh, God, I have nothing. Do you have any idea what's happening? Imagine God saying, yeah, that's my idea. I'm the one who suggested to Satan that, hey, has that considered my servant Job? Okay, thank you. And it's inexplicable. And uh, you, you give God the benefit of the doubt. And, of course, Job, uh, he, he's just um, he's the example that we use time and time again. Be remiss if I didn't. Self-induced suffering. Uh, you, you went through something, and, and, and it's your own fault. And the financial reverse because you discipline. You know, I, I have a credit card in my pocket, and, and I will buy a couple Diet Cokes on my way home tonight and with extra ice, and my wife has lemons in the refrigerator, so I cut them in uh, force, and I squeeze it in. So basically, I'm juicing. I can quit any time I want. I run addiction program. Get off my back. And, uh, but, you know, listen, I've never, and my wife deserves a large portion of the credit for sure, uh, but we have never, ever, ever, trying to get my number, aren't you? And uh, we have never paid interest on a credit card, ever. Ever. And we use it a lot. Yeah. Whoosh, swipe that thing, no payments for 30 days. That's awesome. And really? I'm, some of you can't handle that. The, 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 you can't, the lack of discipline. But you're financially reversed, and you can't reverse the financial reversal because self-sabotaging behavior. Self and induced financial problems, emotional problems, and uh, physical problems, reaping what you've sown. And of course, there can be a ap uh, positive application to that. Self-induced suffering. You know, I mentioned the volunteer military that we have. They volunteered for that. You know, uh, there, my, my brother was going to join. He ended up in the Air Force, and, and, but he joined the Army first, and at his going away party, he broke his foot. And so, they kind of canceled it with delayed entry and he ended up going in the Air Force. But he had the pamphlets and I had never aspired to the military ever growing up. And, but I remember looking at one of his pamphlets and, and I was flipping through it one day, uh, being a bored and, uh, kid, and I was flipping through there and they, they had an animated picture of paratroopers. And they used what I call third grade psychology. They said, now this is, this is America's elite, the all-American, the most decorated unit in American military history. Don't even attempt this unless you're tough enough. And I said, Psh, I ain't going, but if I ever do, that's where I'm going. And I had no, no design or dreams or aspirations to join the military, but when I went to a recruiter, I said, I want to be airborne. 
And, uh, and again, knowing what they were going to do. You're going to push up Fort Bragg till I get tired. Amazing the stamina they had as they weren't doing any push-ups at all. And, uh, and so, you know, but I'm glad they broke us down and, and, uh, and remolded us into soldiers and paratroopers and on and on and on. But we, we volunteered for that. You know, The Greatest Generation, the book that Tom Brokaw authored, they were the greatest generation because of what they went through. But they did not want their children to go through what they went through. And consequently, we have a decadent society. Well, I don't want my kids to go through that. But when you went through that, it made you who you are. You know, now we got everybody, you got, so you got a family of four wearing their bike helmets and antibacterial dispensers everywhere. And, you know, it's like, come on. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. I see a family of four. I never want to beat up a family of four so much as a seat wearing their helmets. And if you wear your helmets, that's fine. But uh, you're going to have helmet hair. I'm just going to warn you. And, you know. By the way, a sense of humor and levity when there's uh, quite a bit of gravity to the situation is a wonderful survival mechanism that God gives us. But self-induced suffering. Some of you need to allow yourself or put yourself through, you know, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not poking fun at anybody. But we got a billboard on 8094 and another one on 65, and it says obesity is a disease, not a choice, not a decision. Obesity is a disease, not a decision. Really? And, and I'm not picking on anybody, I'm not. But coincidentally, anyone who's ever caught the disease of obesity caught it from a Twinkie. And, you know, it's <laughs> not my fault. It's not your fault. No, it's your fault. Take responsibility. Don't spend. Don't eat. I got a diet plan. I would sell that many books. Eat less, exercise more. That's it. Don't you got a pill? You got drips or drops or something? Yeah, whatever. Uh, but it still involves, you can drip and drop and take the shots, but you've got to eat a whole lot less. It's your caloric intake. Ultimately, it gets back to that. And then you're going to need to re-drip if you keep, go back to your old lifestyle. Folks, we've got to suffer. And you can pick the categories you want, you get the point. But self-induced suffering, as a, as a church, collectively, and yes, break it down individually, we need to decide to be, what made First Baptist great? Hardcore, elite, upper echelon. Brother Eddie mentioned that we've been arrogant in the past and, and uh, probably intoxicated with unbroken success. But you know what? God gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. And humility is not thinking of yourself. It's not thinking of yourself at all. But it's just, you know what? I don't need the credit. I don't need the applause. I don't need the accolades. And I'm just going to humble myself, forget all about myself. Uh, it's not, again, low self-esteem. It's no self-esteem. Christ made himself of no reputation. And praise the Lord, and I'm done. Praise the Lord, we have a Savior that suffered. And we ought to, we ought to fellowship and with his sufferings. If he would have quit on Calvary's hill, every one of us would be on our way to hell tonight. No hope of eternity. No grace. No mercy. Wouldn't be a long-suffering God like he is, and but endured uh, the pain and the shame and beaten beyond human recognition, pain beyond human comprehension. He went through it. And that ought to motivate us. If the cross does not motivate you, you are not going to be motivated. And it's just that's the way it is. What are you doing for the Lord? Of course, I asked rhetorically. We got, we got some hardcore college students. You know what? Many, many, many a college student, you're going to hit the zenith, the pinnacle, the climatic point of your life. You're going to summit in college. You know, uh, those of us who have worked with youth, how sad and tragic it is. The best days of your life are in high school or junior high. And uh, be like a Dr. Colston and say, may the, you know, by the grace of God and with omnipotent aid, I'll go out in a blaze of glory with a body that is failing, but a mind still sharp and the Holy Spirit can aid me. with the Moffat, and what a great example, Mrs. Moffat, 40 years in this. That's awesome. And 40 years of giving up Saturdays and Sundays and got Dr. Cowling, of course, and on and on. We got great examples, but the hoary head is evidence. We need another generation to kick in. And so, you know what, I'll, any, any, any analogy you want to get, I'll pick up the, I'll carry the torch, I'll pick up the baton, whatever. The, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suffer. I'm going to go without. And so people can go to heaven. I want my life to count and impact eternity. What's it going to be?